my great pleasure to introduce the one and only traveling in transit performer from the University of Chichester, the theatre manager, uh, stage hand, crew, actor, uh, academic, sweep, uh, for one afternoon only, uh, by your <laughs> majesty's in pleasure, <laughs> the one and only Dr. Andrew Wilford, the person who puts the, the last uh, in the tripod of this triumvirate for convening this conference. <laughs> You'll have to excuse me if I must up the colloquium as a space for seemingly rambling anecdote. And forgive me for turning up in what might be considered the worst kind of holiday movie or some kind of terrible live link to a spy surveillance device. But when you join me is in the act of leaving Beirut. I'm going to attempt to avoid what Zizek identifies as the quote, pretentious pseudo-intellectual exercise of European postmodernists who use a foreign land or city as a screen onto which to project their morbid dystopias. I'm conscious of not only tarrying with this by screening the projection of the cities behind me, but also because when I say I'm leaving Beirut, really I should be saying I'm leaving Hamra. Or maybe more properly, I'm leaving the Corniche and the campus of the University of America in Beirut, where I spent the majority of the last three days. No. Rather than project onto this city, or to make a project of Beirut as a city thing, I will engage with where the city projected me to, what of the city was projected into me, so that in thinking about leaving Beirut, I'm researching what of these districts in Beirut didn't fully leave me. I'm leaving early on a Sunday morning, and by way as if by way of not wanting to make an exception of Beirut, this dawn was no different, no less sanguine, than any ordinary easy Sunday morning in New York, or London, or Sheffield, or Berlin. I'd rather consider Beirut as a particularity, and be able to draw comparison in normative terms, and in these terms, the act of leaving Beirut will suffice. In just over a month's time, you will also join me on the day before Thanksgiving, leaving Bethlehem. We are comfortably cruising down the clear highway to Rafiq Hariri International, cutting through southern Beirut, where arrival at night and the mountain range have cloaked the expanse of the residential areas with little illumination on both sides of the road. Now, in the daylight, the low belt, sunbaked buildings were exposed. A vast sprawl of the city I didn't see. And these areas, according to the map issued by the UK government's foreign office, were my no-go zones. Those no-go zones that every city has for tourists. My driver is called Hamza. It means five. His card reads, taxi to all Lebanon where I'd been trying to clarify exactly what would be required for me to travel to Beirut, to Beirut, I'd encountered a recommendation written in comments under official government advice, describing Lebanon as a golden gate to jihad in Syria. The easiest option was to travel as a tourist, rather than as a declared academic, or with academic purposes. I wouldn't have to hand over three months of bank statements to the authorities, and this was reason enough. I appreciated the co-conveners of Beirut Bodies in Public, Elias and Ella. I, I appreciated, the, appreciated them framing it as a three-day performance workshop, whilst really I found myself as part of the city's first public art festival since On the drive into Hamra, when I first arrived, 
Hamza and I had discussed where he might like to take me, the many ancient cities that I might visit. And neatly interspersed with these recommendations, he offered a degree of advice and caution that I might observe as a foreign visitor to Lebanon. For example, as we joined the slow trickle of traffic in the bustling cosmopolitan area, a group of young girls were making their way down the trickle of traffic while selling roses. Hamza instructed me not to wind down my window. The girls, he explained, are Syrian refugees and they would attempt to sell me more than just flowers. He was careful to add that he wouldn't want me to be made uncomfortable during my stay in Lebanon. This was my first inoculation, my first dose of protectionist and patriarchal care that I would receive as a foreign guest in Beirut throughout my stay. As Hamra, Hamza continued to talk about Syrian refugees, it was as if they could only spoil my visit, interrupt my cultural experience, and that these bodies in public should not belong to what I told Hamza was a weekend away. In leaving Beirut, I turned to mentally counting guarded military checkpoints and security scans from the perimeter to the passport gate, noticing the extent to which children were particularly selected to be separated uh, and questioned in uh, booths. Whilst I, as with upon my arrival, I felt a sense of autoimmunity ushered through where others were subject to much more intense scrutiny. But at the point of stamping my exit, the passport checking officer hesitates. His hand held in place, poised. He looked at me. And how did you spend your time in Beirut, he asks. <clears throat> I'm a tourist because since 2009, I've learned to embody a kind of dark play that moves beyond the prankish, quote, invisible game frames of performance and the instant gratifications that are associated with either Richard Schechner's dark play or Foley and Lennon's dark Taurus. I'm in this for the long game. During 2009, and in part as performative self-sacrifice, a kind of functional failed suicide bound up in a lived durational response to the 2002 Dubrovka theatre hostage taking. I took to a radicalization of my everyday appearance and subsequently a perpetual revolutionizing of the paradigms by which my practice could proceed, could move on and could travel. I've only really done one staged performance as wannabe Warhol. And this was in a Havant shopping mall for a local literature festival. Over a microphone, I read excerpts from A to B and Back Again, The Philosophy of Andy Warhol, to a dirge of the Velvet Underground jamming and a backdrop footage with Nico and her son, Christian, aged about five, looking like they'd been in the factory for a few days. It's inappropriate for a shopping mall. The organizers of the Lit Festival had bungled the space booking, which was meant to be in the center of a plaza, but instead the mobile company, the mobile phone company's regular paid for pitch had taken its place. So their local poets were rod largely refusing to play in a corridor of space beneath an escalator and opposite a retail store. This was not a place where the public would stand and watch. Where I'd originally agreed to 15 minutes, originally to be staged in a library, and then a stage in the center of a mall, was now with a transient audience on two sides, with the audience on the left-hand side of the stage ascending with all the dignity of the gods in Brecht's good person of Sichuan. I was offered an open platform, unlimited time, should I want to take it. Be both the good person for the festival and prostitute any sense of professional performance sensibilities for myself. 
Sure, I have a video of this performance on my YouTube channel, but what the camera doesn't show is the gradual accumulation of the security response. By 25 minutes in, there are five security guards and their manager, as my sole audience, stood with their arms folded and the public walking through this passage. I had begun to slip in quotes from Ulrika Meinhof as soon as they started to turn up. So my text went something like, Andy Warhol, the most beautiful thing in Tokyo is McDonald's. The most beautiful thing in Stockholm is McDonald's. The most beautiful thing in Beirut is McDonald's. But you have the most beautiful thing right here also. The most beautiful thing in heaven is McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Protest is when I say I don't like this. Resistance is when I put an end to what I don't like. Protest is when I say I refuse to go along with this anymore. And resistance is when I make sure everybody else stops going along with it too. They became spect actors and I directed them like a bunch of clowns, moving from their frenetic desire to want me to stop to simply subjecting me to their disapproving gaze. The drone, the feedback, the dropped banana skin. I wish all of this was just a diversion for something else to then take place in the map. This was in 2009. And then I would get to see this troop of security fall over themselves like, to echo William Burroughs, frightened pilots calling in, ex calling in experts to tell them with bush which buttons to push. In their eyes, I was the problem and they saw themselves is, as in need of a quick solution. <laughs> With only the flow of the economy, the shopping public, my small entourage of chic flunkies, and a clipboard-wielding festival organizer, organizer, festival organizer in the way of this realization. Theater is like my time travel machine, but it's really impractical in terms of predicting when the conjured forthcoming will really take a place. So in the meantime, I'm all for making what Julia Kristeva wrote when she stated that modern theatre does not take a place. I've been making theatre that does not take a place for a long time. I've been running a successful covert not bombing campaign since 2009. It must be successful. You've not heard about it. And I've not been profiting or profiteering through to where we are here and now in this room and where we find ourselves presently spatio-temporally shifted out of joint and into the act of leaving Beirut. This theatre cannot expect to provide precise coordinates, a non-vertiginous cognitive map, or a clean matrix of stable performance registers. If it is a line of flight, then its passage is turbulent, or at best the forecast is of more turbulence to come. During this flight, the seatbelt light is always on, and there is a fault affecting your in-flight entertainment system. So the choice of movie is reset every 15 minutes, and this flight is long haul. I used to find myself fighting this, quote, vortex of life, and the precarious fear that the sky might fall in at any time, to quote Artaud's prescription but I'm long since done with such enthusiasm, anxiety, passion or fear as drivers to creativity, to creative productivity. Truth is, I'm through with creative productivity. I'll add to that inauthenticity too. Sorry, authenticity too. I only know the inauthentic. According to Zizek, during war conditions, theater is the representational means during which reality can be withstood or a frame of making comprehensible the ways in which the inhumane excesses of war might be experienced. When the going gets incomprehensible, the real defaults to its theatrical modes of representation in order that it might just be intolerable, an experience as the art of living played through a game of death. What, in what transpired to be my last living conversation with my grandmother, it was in informing her that I was going to be speaking at the University of America in Beirut. Beirut, she repair, repeats back to me. Beirut, I repeat back to her. <clears throat> A silence. And then there's some thought before she asks, what is it like there these days? 
I respond to her, I couldn't really know that I hadn't been there. But a colleague of mine in a theatre company, Alex Kelly from Third Angel, had been recently, and he'd reassured me that I would have a great time. So it's not like it was then, my grandmother. I say, do you mean during the Civil War in the 1980s, Grand? No, it's not like that. Is it more like it was before that, she asks. Oh, no, Grant. I don't think time could be turned back for any place like that, I reply. I'm a tourist because I was born during the Angry Brigade's campaign against the spectacle. My living spectacle was the virtual overnight de de decimation of Sheffield steel industries, and then the belt of mines in Yorkshire to the Markham Pit in Derbyshire. I grew up with the IRA, the UDA, the SDS, Thatcher, the Rort Army Fraction, the Red Army Fraction, and the Red Brigades. I feel like I still have so much to learn from travel, but terrorism's a part of my birthright, my teenage rites of passage, and it was just rebooted for the 20th century target demographics. For me, there's just as much to learn from Putin's herbicidal bombardment of Grozny on the night of the new millennium, New Year's Eve 1999, as there is from 911. And just as Putin claimed that there was a, quote, archipelago of terror that reached from the Philippines to Kosovo some time before Russia's axis of evil, a spatio-temporal snapshot of the war on terror and its consequence may well as be, be examined through Beirut as a lens, lens as it could the iconic photograph of tourists to New York viewing 911 from the Brooklyn banks of the Hudson. I traveled to the US for the first time on the day after, uh, the, day after the announcement of Bin Laden's ass assassination. I landed in JFK International. That's a joke. They should call it Tricky, Nick Tricky Dicky International. And within three days, I nearly found myself stabbed in a sushi bar on the edge of Spanish Harlem. The queue for the Army Recruitment Center in Times Square extended to the doors of the Disney store, with the face of Bin Laden like a digital mural on the giant news screens. In Nolita, vendors sell t-shirts. OBL DOA, 1st of May 2011. Another reads, game over. I don't look to correct the analysis with Al-Qaeda disenfranchised. CEO liquidated or anything like. How did you spend your time in Beirut, sir? I'm a tourist because I know lies of omission are far preferable to commissioning them or attempt to spin a deceit. And besides, my answer to this officer need not fabricate, fabulate, or filibuster. I spent the time in utter supplication. I yielded to Beirut's projections into me prompting me to be propelled deeper into places why not, where I might not ordinary cho ordinarily choose to go. The no-go zones of how my memory of the city was mediated during the Lebanese Civil War throughout the 80s, and how this was interwoven with the Christian Zionist view of the conflict that I inherited from family, church, and the Pentecostal evangelical community. Beirut reminds me of all that I've rejected in my life all that I haven't compromised for, and all that I haven't resolved, these are exposed as a future wound that this child of the 70s, the early 80s teen, needed to grow away from. I was born on Good Friday. This is something that Beckett made, made both false claim to and made virtue of in his work. I just find that it makes me susceptible to a kind of involuntary compulsion to stepping up wherever or whenever a scapegoat is needed. I should get it on a business card. Scapegoat, professional self-sacrifice maker. Any time, any place, any situation, no kidding. Theatre has also made self-sacrifice easy for me as an art of depersonalization. I'd like to think of this as the theatre that has been done to me. But Beirut showed me that I might as well be perpetually, systematically reducing myself to the point where all the irreducible components are equally archived or disposed of. Something like Michael Landy's breakdown, where he methodologically pulverized all his material possessions. 
For me, there's a sense of living this act over years and only afforded by my position as a, perform as a performance researcher with a need for a practice as a means of investigation, keeping the sense that doing this constitutes some kind of martyrdom. That is the wolf to keep at the door, keeping one square empty for the absent higher abstract ideal or cause to become entrapped and to circulate through the act. Now that is pro proving vital to my practice, and it's like trying to net a spectre. I find some advocacy and crystallization of this in the Lebanese thinker Jalal Tufik's warning to writers. Quote, most writers and filmmakers address the social person in us. A small number address the solitary person, but there are others still, rare, who addresses the one for whatever circumstances is in a state of depersonalization. They accompany someone even when he has deserted himself. Since these instances of depersonalization are rare, and since one does not often wish to be reminded of them, the latter filmmakers and writers, books and films are not popular. Dispense with any sense of good intention. That is what is echoed of Deleuze in Tufit, who in turn correlates, correlates Deleuze with Will, William Burroughs in an indebtedness that the French philosopher did not make so explicit good intentions are inevitably badly punished. And how did I spend my time in Beirut? I listened to whatever Beirut chose to tell me and saw wherever this city thing had permitted itself to show. There was an occasion where Eliash, one of the co-conveners, managed to get permission past a military guard to get a series of views on um, Roman ruins. And these Roman ruins were like a scandal in Beirut. It was revealed by a journalist that these Roman ruins were basically being um, pulverized and used as foundations in new buildings. Um, and these Roman ruins are located by the St. George Maronite Cathedral, which right next door is the Muhammad al-Amin Mosque. And these two buildings seem to compete with each other, going higher and higher. So one has um, an extension to uh, a spire, so the minaret would be extended on the other building, and it seems like they're competing to get closer to heaven. Trying to spatially, temporarily locate myself in Beirut proved only possible upon leaving Beirut. It is a reel that was only made possible at the point of stamping my departure, and right now between the hand holding that stamp and the print on the passport is my answer to what has been considered for a second time as a question that is not without its philosophical dimension. How did I spend my time in Beirut? I can't think of many places worse than passport control to find oneself suddenly faced with what might be considered an epiphany, but later might merely turn out to be a lucid interval. This momentarily con consideration of the question in its metaphysical and ethico-economical dimensions would not arrive at an answer to satisfy the God's question. Again, Tufik expresses an experience of extra dimensionality when he writes, did anyone else see the cinema theater in the cinema theater? Did anyone see me become contorted and elongated in all dimensions, in brackets, not only the well-known three dimensions of space and one of time, but also six or seven extra dimensions? And I think here, really, Tufik is expressing affectivities, hiacities, alarm vital, and other um, rhetorics that exist within De Deleuze's notions of ismus. But Tufik is writing in relation to film. How do we bring these affectations to the city, to the public space? How do we write or film a city through these dimensions of its alarm vital? How do we choose the experience how do we choose to experience the everyday, the highest city of the city? For the four days that I was in Hamra district and the Corniche area of Beirut, I focused mainly on the walls, and I managed to weave my way into the interconnectivity of the city life through the street. The walls sometimes screamed and sometimes protested. They were wounded, crumbled, bomb-blasted, or replastered in a way that preserved the exhibitions of an the exhibition of an explosion. 
the city was a reimagining of Cornelia Parker's cold dark matter, an exploded view. According to virtualtourist.com, a fun thing to do in Beirut is visit the Rafiq Harari uh, Memorial. Outside the St. George Hotel is um, a sculpture called The Torch. And it looks at once like a flame and a bomb exploding. And Rafiq Hariri was killed in a huge explosion outside uh, the St. George Hotel, which is still uh, hasn't been renovated. And they, the sculpture marks that spot. And at the time when Rafiq Hariri uh, died, uh, the torch lights up. It's my second assassination site in less than a year. Um, how did I spend my time, officer? Most pleasantly, thank you. I'm sure that my visit in Beirut will stay with me for much longer than I could visit, but I hope very much to return soon to your very beautiful country. Yes, but what did you do during your time here, sir? Hearing the inner voices of Henry Rollins and Ulrika Meinhof advising you of the real situation here is much like having an epiphany. It's just not a recommended stream of consciousness to pursue or a healthy impulse to trust at any border control. And now I am engaged in fixed eye contact with the guard. Henry Rollins reminds me, Nietzsche called them the tiny masters of today, the little shitheels that never get what they need so bad. Ulrika Meinhof adds, quote, this is a problem. And of course we, we can say cops are swine. We say our man in a uniform's a pig, not a human being, so we must tackle him. I mean, we mustn't talk to him. It's wrong to talk to these people at all. Of course, they may be shooting. Obviously, they'll reach for their service revolvers, their tear gas, their grenades, and their semi-automatic weapons. Obviously, they will escalate if nothing else does the trick. I'm a tourist because I know that the equation in the eyes of in the eyes of authority is that every civilian is a potential terrorist subject, whilst every vigilant citizen equals cop. I'm trying to uh, de-escalate this situation, but reflexively, everything that I've represented whilst being in Beirut might have brought the gaze to my suspect presence by persona of Pax Americana, the chic pastiche of Chichester brought to my hipster in Hamra. And I cannot guarantee that all this could not be responsible for disturbing a degree of trauma, inflaming latent anger, provoking sensitive wounds, hurt, turning head. I turned head. This is not an answer for the border guard. But nor was this action of turning head bristling with all its Althusserian ideological pretensions of interpolation because I represented anything meaning radical alterity. Any observer, spectator, or casual witness, if you will, would have had to know me for being the theater machine, the wannabe Warhol. My name is not Andy Warhol. I really don't have his drives to fame and fortune, but I do have the same initials. <laughs> My alterity, the alt, alt of my everyday theatre is a radical, antagonistic foreignness, R-A-F. It is most open to the otherness of one's own culture that can be found elsewhere. The otherness to oneself that is yielded to those not seeking to merely assimilate space, neo-colonialized place, or plunder. I am, not, I am to be considered a storyteller, a theatre mythomaniac, and thus susceptible to becoming an exot, but not in a way that blankly exoticizes. Hamra was more than generous in providing for the exot in this scapegoat. Beirut offered a foreign otherness to one's own culture whilst walking in one's own shoes. And this was really brilliantly demonstrated by Ella's exhibition with the convince um, sneakers. Tim Etchells in the foreword to Theatre in the City writes, and only writes of one city specifically, and that is Beirut. He writes about the language of beeps in the traffic, how one beep means get, move, get a move on, how two beeps mean really get a move on, how three beeps means get the fuck the move on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I consider what co-convener of Beirut Bodies in Public, Ella Parry Davis, has con come to term the amplified ethics of foreign artists working in Beirut, with due regard for the agendas that are brought to producing work there. This question of amplified ethics is a primacy in questioning uh, both my own imperatives and the potentiality of consequences in one's interventions. It is a, as though the city challenges good intentions and fixed intentions, questions the means by which cause and effect can be forecast. It just disrupts distinctions in whether an act of production is subjectifying or objectifying whether it's iterative or commemorative. For me, Beirut is better experienced through a sense of contingency, or at least some kind of rogue agency, looking sideways perhaps, perhaps to break eggs but not make omelets, in the act of performing the public space. I cannot assume that the hipster in Hamra was any less innocent than the young girl going to war. We. Um, during Beirut Bodies of Public, there was this exercise in which a, a, young, uh, a young girl cycled a bike through Hamra with a big platform. Um, I need a few more minutes. Um, <laughs> I've not even spoken about Beirut. Um, I have what I consider as much self-knowingness on my parachuting into Beirut as reflexively possible. I'm UK boots on the ground. I'm just a taxi ride from the Syrian theater of conflict. It's less than 50 miles to turning my weekend here into a Mujahedi mini break. <coughs> I have different kinds of foreign interests to differing people here. I can never escape this inevitability. I've chosen to embrace it, and I'm not about to have a Levantine lucid interval as I'm leaving Lebanon. Again, the difference between exceptionalizing Beirut and particularizing Beirut in aspects such as its diurnal, nocturnal dynamics alongside the bigger geopolitical scene and scenarios cannot be understated. There is a consensual conservative hammer by day and a permissive liberal hammer by night. Like Chichester, there's a kind of consensual, consensual curfew. And on the midweek nights, midnight signals a general muting in the street drain, leaving only the tinnitus of the city. The early morning adam or bells of the cathedral as waking alarms might factor into why midnight marks sleep mode for both cities. But these amplified calls to prayer bring a circadian rhythm to what Solidaire, the award-winning Lebanese joint stock architecture company who hold responsibility for the reconstruction in Beirut's central downtown, they sloganize this city as their Janus-faced, quote, ancient city of the future. The head turns. What did I do during my time in Beirut? I developed two covert mean, means of filming. <coughs> One, to film what was happening behind me to see what happened when the heads turned, <coughs> where the camera was swinging upside down from a lanyard and inverted, turned back up the right way up in the edit. I also um, had my iPhone in a, a leather wallet so you couldn't see I, that I was filming. What did I do in Beirut? I deterred Hamra Street with Dima Masood. I watched a number, sorry, I watched a member of the Lebanese army report that the activity in Marta Square, which the military ministry was scrutinizing through the security camera, was in fact ballet. It was performed by two female contemporary dancers uh, exercising in a circle. At first he thought they were following a fitness routine before deciding that ballet was a suitable turn to report to his superiors and to permit the continuance of the contemporary dance. I was party to a planned trespass, and that although I did not directly participate in this action, neither did I report it to the relevant authorities. Within 24 hours, I was in a car with a stranger to escort me to UAB, following advice from a Lebanese military personnel. I drank from carrot juice without frontiers in an area prohibiting such exchanges. I filmed from the rooftop of my hotel during sundown without express permission. I secretly filmed the streets of Hammer at night and along the Corniche during the day. I did not seek the permission of those filmed. I filmed security guards behind placards of a luxury seaside complex obstructing a view of the sea. I did not seek permission as he reached for his phone and described me to whoever he was talking to. 
I covertly filmed a Lebanese street cop watching a piece of interventionist street theater. The collective simulate how the city's developers are exploiting the public, eroding the public sphere, building for a, um, an economic elite who may not even exist anymore. The street cop watches a cardboard and concrete cityscape built to obstruct the sea view. At the end of the street theater, as has become a tradition in Lebanon, there is a sudden end, much like there was to the Civil War. And the sudden end is that the cardboard cityscape is demolished, revealing the sea. The actors, the members of public who were participating, or merely those watching, become indistinguishable from each other. Ella Perry Davis says that in the movie, she sees the street cop as an angel and I think of Walter Benjamin's Angel of History. I'll leave it there.